the government's official economic report card. The latest GDP report shows a considerable slowdown in economic growth. Alexis, on the one hand, the economy is still growing, but obviously that growth is slowing. Here we'll get to know about the story of Nauru. Having a land area of only 8 square miles and fewer than 11,000 people, it is the world's third smallest country, behind Monaco and Vatican City. Because this tiny island is the South Pacific, was the location of the most economic collapse ever, it more than makes up for the size in terms of the lesson it can teach us about the economy. We've talked a lot in the past about how natural resources may significantly impact the economies of many nations. Consider the enormous oil wealth that several of the Persian Gulf republics enjoy. But when improperly managed, wealth derived from natural resources can occasionally have negative long-term effects. Some economists even refer to this as the natural resource cost. This tiny country of the Pacific Islands is perhaps the best example of what can go wrong. The nation experienced rags to riches before regressing to a state that was somehow worse than before it became wealthy. Because it is one of the few occasions in history when we have been able to study the economic dynamics that drive these booms clearly. The lesson of Nauru is one of that all economists can learn from. So how did Nauru get to be the richest nation on earth? What errors did they commit that caused them to waste this wealth? And finally, how did this small nation truly become worse off over time? The island of Nauru was first made known to Europeans in 1789 when a British ship passed by a region with a central plateau covered with greenery, surrounded by swaying palm trees and bordered by white sandy beaches. The British named the island Pleasant Island because of its stunning scenery. The first outsiders arrived on Nauru, only a third the size of Manhattan, a few decades later. At first, it was assumed that the island's only resources were pigs and coconuts, before the discovery of high-grade phosphate ore by a British geologist. Simply put, the nation didn't become oil rich. Instead, the researchers discovered dried bird droppings and algae, which were more valuable because they could be used primarily as fertilizers, animal feed, and cosmetics. When it was first found around the start of the 20th century, 80% of Pleasant Island was rich in this mineral. A previously unknown treasure of accumulated seabird feces mixed with marine microbes. Although it may sound horrible, it was crucial for feeding a burgeoning world population, making it very lucrative. Mining rights were promptly sold to Germany, which at the time had colonized Nauru. As shipping ports, processing plants, and supporting industries sprang up on a spit of land barely larger than Central Park over the ensuing years, approximately 80 million metric tons of this valuable substance were exported from the tiny island. At this point, Germany was occupied by the First World War, which allowed Australia to seize Nauru for itself. The island had recently developed into an offshore mining facility by this time. Most phosphates were sold to farmers in Australia, New Zealand, and Great Britain at subsidized prices, or mates rates, as they say in Australia. Unfortunately, decades of mining had already significantly altered the natural terrain of Nauru by this point. Back then, National Geographic referred to the top part of the island as a ghastly tract of land, very abruptly downward from Pleasant Land. It only gets worse from here on out. Japan conquered the island during World War II, terrorizing Nauru with forced labor camps and mass drownings. Only 600 Nauruzians remained alive at the end of the World War II. When the war was finished and Japan submitted, the island was once more given to the Australians, who proceeded to exploit the island's foul resources. Phosphate mining activities reached fresh record highs between 1945 and 1968. Nobody was pushing the Nauruzians to mine phosphate when they finally gained their independence. But at that time, their whole economy already depending on selling this natural resource. Independent Nauru had lost one-third of its islands of mining, and its people now resided nearby in a moonless wasteland that was suddenly even more horrifying appealing. A small portion of the island's population was capable of digging odorous boulders out of the ground. Due to their small size and remote location worldwide, many enterprises were unviable. The island had made a lot of money from mining phosphorus, but at this point, most of it had been taken by the countries that had the island as a colony. Because they lacked the resources and experience to establish other enterprises, the number of phosphate experts was raised so they could continue to milk the cow while she was still living. They had no other viable competitive options. The Nerusians properly demanded a piece of the action, even though it was clear that the phosphate supply would run out within a lifespan or two. This marked the beginning of a period in Nauru's history when some referred to it as the Pacific's richest small island. A little more than 10 years after gaining independence, Nauru was acclaimed as the world's richest nation overall in per capita income. 
The GDP per capita in 1981 was $27,000, equivalent to $88,000 in today's dollars. In comparison, the U.S. GDP per capita at the time was $14,000. The average Nauruan was twice as wealthy as the average American. Naturally, the GDP per capita is far from an accurate indicator of how well the typical citizen is doing. And if you want to understand more about GDP, watch this video on our second channel, Economics Explained Essentials. GDP per capita is still the simplest way to compare economies because it offers us at least a rough idea of how much wealth each country has. With their rich phosphate reserves, Nauru was now prospering independently, enjoying economic stability and political independence. Many people in Nauru took the counsel given to retired sports stars to heart and retired at the height of their success. Despite the country's small size, sports vehicles were the accessory to have. The island's entire perimeter can be driven around slowly in an hour, so it's hardly the best location for drag racing. One police chief decided to bring a Lamborghini to the island but realized he couldn't fit in the driver's seat. He could not operate his new gadget because of the impending health emergency on the island. An epidemiologist reported that Nauru had an obesity pandemic by 1980. Increased prosperity and unhealthy food choices were the underlying causes. The World Health Organization listed Nauru as having the lowest life expectancy of 170 countries in 2002 due to the country's high consumption of junk food, high average body mass index, and high rate of obesity. The Nauruian people only received a small portion of the income from phosphate mining during the colonial era. Given the context, they were motivated to continue mining after independence by economic need rather than avarice. A lifestyle where everything must be imported, including food and water, is not sustainable. Nobody bothered to waste time on production because phosphate mining was the focus of everyone's attention. After all, the topsoil was removed from mining operations, therefore the area was already overused for cultivation. Given the otherwise constrained resources of the Mauritian economy, this is simply a textbook case of Dutch sickness taken to an extreme. Diversifying the economy is one method of preventing Dutch disease. Middle Eastern countries that actively work to diversify their economy can be observed using this strategy. Learn more about this in our most recent video on the large, foolish mega projects that are boosting the economy of the Gulf states. Although it is yet up for significant dispute whether or not these projects will be effective, at least they're trying. The nation's poor track record of managing its phosphate wealth has severely influenced ability and confidence. We can only award Nauru a 3 out of 10 considering its past. However, the GDP decreased by more than 90% in the 1990s after they ran out of phosphate. The economy has, however, grown significantly since then, with an average annualized rate of 7%. The detention facilities and foreign aid have nearly entirely been responsible for the growth. However, 7% annually is amazing under any circumstances. Nauru thus receives a rating of 9 out of 10. Then there is industry. The primary industry in Nauru now is outsourcing refugee detention facilities. While this continues to be a valuable source of income for the nation, it does not enhance the technological capabilities required to develop later businesses should this one source of income ever dry up. Nauru receives a 2 out of 10 because of this. It's the story of Nauru, the story of the richest country in the world lost 90% of its GDP.